So I'm the Dr. Priya Sasakolambage from Sabargaon Medical Faculty, and I'm uh, also reading for my PhD, which is on skeletal dysplasia in terms of epidemiological and molecular genetic studies in the Sri Lankan population. So we'll look at. Uh, so my talk is basically on skeletal dysplasia and clinical genomic aspects around it. In this presentation, we'll first define skeletal dysplasia, uh, comparing it with dysostosis. Uh, then we'll look at the burden of skeletal dysplasia worldwide as well as in Sri Lanka and uh, classification of uh, skeletal, skeletal dysplasia as well. Uh, after that, we'll discuss in detail the diagnostic approach and the importance of genetic uh, testing. Then we'll briefly highlight the key management principles. Uh, finally, we'll identify some of the main skeletal dysplasias that we frequently encounter. Skeletal dysplasia, so osteochondrodysplasia, are a broad heterogeneous group of heritable disorders that have generalized developmental abnormalities in bone and cartilage tissue. By definition, skeletal dysplasia have generalized abnormalities, while dysostosis is a term that is used to call the disorders characterized by abnormalities in a single or group of bones. There are the defect is in the skeletal element formation that occur during early embryogenesis or organogenesis. So the phenotype we see at birth usually remains static and unchanged in dysostosis. In contrast, in skeletal dysplasia, uh, the defect affects the skeletal growth and homeostasis. So the phenotype usually evolves and changes throughout the life. Over time, this distinction has become blurred and more often we see that dysostosis are considered under the skeletal dysplasia. As you all know, skeletal dysplasia are a group of rare diseases. However, collectively it has a birth prevalence of one in 5,000 births. When we look at the prevalence rates at birth of different types of skeletal dysplasia, achondroplasia, osteogenesis imperfecta, tantaphoric dysplasia, uh, are found to be more common than the rest of the disease entities. Likewise, we looked at the reported skeletal dysplasia cases in Sri Lanka using EIMMR data that is available uh, in a given year. Uh, so in a given year, more than half of the skeletal dysplasia reported are osteogenesis imperfecta cases, which is an interesting finding that we observed. There have been multiple uh, attempts to classify these disorders. Before 1970, there were uh, this uh, group of disorders were categorized uh, according to their presentation. So short stature was classified into short limb and short trunk, likewise uh, lethal and non-lethal skeletal dysplasia. Uh, majority of these uh, skeletal dysplasia are non-lethal. Uh, so here are some lethal uh, skeletal dysplasia shown below. Osteogenesis imperfecta type 2 is the commonest one that we see, and tantrophoric dysplasia is the second commonest, which is usually present uh, as a stillborn babies and oh, they die soon after birth from respiratory failure. And here are the other rest of lethal skeletal dysplasia. Nosologic and classification of genetic skeletal disorders is the most helpful classification out there which was formulated in 1970 uh, and had several revisions over the last years. In its latest revision in uh, 2019, uh, they observed uh, 436 disease entities, which were categorized under 42 different groups, uh, basically that share a common molecular basis or pathway and reported 364 disease causing genes. So in this uh, figure, you can see uh, this FDFR3 chondrodysplasia dysplasia group comprises of uh, tantrophoric uh, dysplasia, achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, likewise. So like this, uh, there are 42 different groups uh, with 436 disease entities. So this is a very comprehensive uh, classification and a uh, little bit complex as well. So because of that, uh, clinicians love to use this uh, Robin's classification 
uh, as it is very simple and straightforward. Uh, it is based on the anatomical site in the bone, uh, predominant anatomical site actually, and the type of abnormality, hyperplasia or hyperplasia. If you take uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, it is it comes under diaphysis uh, and hyperplasia. This is the area I wanted to highlight the most. So the diagnostic approach of skeletal dysplasias. <coughs> Most SDs are diagnosed based on clinical and radiographic features alone. So when do we need uh, to do molecular diagnosis? So it is indicated when the causal gene is for a disorder is known and either one of these three, when the diagnosis is unclear after clinical, radiological, and if possible, histological examination of the growth plate. So this prevents the diagnosis odyssey and uh, that uh, predicts uh, that uh, sort of uh, lockdown the patients and children over many years. To predict carrier status in families at risk of uh, uh, recessive disorder is the second instance we do uh, molecular diagnosis. Uh, thereby, we predict uh, future risk of recurrence. And also, we do this for prenatal diagnosis in at risk fetuses. Let's look at some uh, the rationale of uh, prenatal diagnosis in the next slide. So the rationale is to inform parents early, those who have had the first baby with a severe skeletal dysplasia and a high recurrence a risk, or uh, to confirm the diagnosis for those with a lethal dysplasia that has been identified during the pregnancy. For an accurate diagnosis, uh, focus history and examination is important, followed by imaging, and if indicated, genetic studies as well. So the, the history, that's those part uh, as highlighted in all previous presentations in the morning, that is pretty important. Uh, and the detailed birth history, developmental history, for female family history is essential. And on examination, serial anthropometric measurements, like sitting and standing height, upper lower segment ratio, arm span, head circumference, uh, limb length is important. Uh, and these are plotted in charts to answer three basic questions. What are these three basic questions? First one is, what is the type of short stature? Whether it's proportional or disproportional. If it is proportionate, whether it's short limb or short trunk. If it is short limb, what is the position of limb shortening? whether rhizomelic, which is the pro uh, proximal segment shortening, uh, or middle segment shortening, or distal segment shortening. So this is very important. This analysis is really important to narrow down the diagnosis. So careful general examination is done to detect dysmorphic features, uh, as mentioned before, especially craniofacial uh, features. And abnormalities in the spine also helps us to come for definitive diagnosis. Uh, as some of uh, the skeletal dysplasias have non-orthopedic complications, examination of systems is also very important. When it comes to imaging, second trimester anomaly scan followed by serial growth scans are carried out for prenatal uh, diagnosis of skeletal dysplasias. If indicated, dentist studies are performed using chorionic villus sampling or uh, amniocentesis. After birth, if skeletal survey uh, of the proband or the index case does not detect, uh, direct us for a definitive diagnosis, then we perform genetic studies to confirm the genetic etiology. This can be done in the proband or as in the family, we can take the parents and the proband, which is called the trio, uh, and as well as a quadruo, which includes another family member. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there is a probable diagnosis, uh, which needs confirmation. If there is a probable diagnosis, which is, needs confirmation, we can straightly request molecular genetic studies uh, otherwise, if there are, is a developmental delay and congenital malformation, we have to go for cytogenetic studies like chromosomal microarray, karyotyping. Uh, when there is only a single gene 
to be tested. Single gene defects like eukonopasia. Single sequencing uh, is enough most of the time, uh, but when there are multiple diseases causing genes, we have to go for next generation sequencing. So this has been uh, already uh, covered, I guess. So uh, there are three main types of uh, next generation sequencing. They are, they are whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and gene panel or target sequencing. Uh, couple of gene panels have been developed recently, but their cost effectiveness is the problem. So uh, studies have shown uh, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing are most economic when used as first line gene uh, test, especially the whole exome sequencing early on in the diagnosis journey. This is the whole exome report, uh, exome sequencing report, uh, giving a diagnosis of uh, 3M syndrome uh, to a patient who was presented to HU. Uh, it is a very rare type of skeletal dysplasia causing, caused by a defect in CUL7 gene. And you get these all the uh, data uh, with the gene list in the report. A filtering strategy is used for gene discovery and variant discovery. Uh, so to narrow down the variance in a stepwise manner. In the first step, we narrow down all the variants seen in the whole genome uh, into a group of rare pathogenic protein altering variants. Uh, and then uh, we use inheritance patterns from the family history and uh, this phenotype matching uh, we can uh, use uh, to further narrow it down uh, uh, to the number of uh, less than 10 uh, variants. So this phenotype matching uh, can be done using these databases like online Mendelian inheritance in man. It is also called as OMIM. Uh, likewise, there is this another one, Ophanet, uh, that is freely available on the internet. These uh, both provide inventories of rare disease and the genes that cause them. Definitive uh, results. Uh, so is, if you are lucky, uh, we get a definitive results with the non uh, this is gene match and a non variant match. This matching is done using variant databases like Clinva. When we get a gene of uncertain significance, or GUS, or variant of uncertain significance, uh, the result is uncertain. So, in that case, we can do a reanalysis after three to four years later on to increase the diagnosis yield. Uh, the one, this one study uh, shows that it improves diagnostic yield for, uh, from 25% to 47%. Here are the key management principles. Uh, we always have to adhere to a multidisciplinary approach. After the accurate diagnosis, apart from medical treatment, management of complications, rehabilitative therapy, psychological, psychological support, we need to uh, provide uh, strong uh, genetic counseling, educating about the risk, uh, recurrence risk and reproductive options. There we lay down all the options on the table uh, for the patient to facilitate them to make their decision. Right. We'll uh, look at some of the uh, frequently found uh, skeletal dysplasias in uh, the clinical setting. Uh, so when you take osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, we, they present with multiple fractures with minor trauma, severe types present at birth, and there's a wide spectrum of OI types. That means at least 19 types have been uh, described up to now. Disproportionate short stature is noted on examination with uh, multiple deformities, typical craniofacial features like uh, triangular face, as well as broad uh, forehead. Uh, and there's poor dentition as well. Uh, and the skull is soft and membranous. So the radiological features, uh, there's generalized osteopenia, multiple heel fractures, coxa vera at the level of the femoral head, uh, other, uh, other you know, more commonly found radiological features, and there are a lot more. 90% uh, of osteogenesis imperfect are a result of Call COL1, A1, and COL1, A2 mutations affecting the uh, formation of type 1 collagen. 
So we can do DNA sequencing to identify these genes. Uh, but the other types, we, we might have to uh, perform whole exome sequencing uh, in order to uh, narrow it down the variance. So these are the main four types of osteogen 16 perfecta. Uh, the main inherent patterns we observe is the autosomal dominant in all these four types. Later on, in the latest revision, they have added these autosomal recessive types as well under osteogenesis imperfecta type 2, 3, and 4. So the lethal one is the type 2, and my case is the type 4. So echondroplasia, I think I uh, already dis uh, discussed in the previous uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Dineshani, so I'm going to skip that one. I just mentioned that it is an autosomal the dominant inheritance, there is autosomal dominant inheritance with, uh, uh, with a FGFR3 single gene mutation uh, leads to a failure of endochondral ossification. So, pseudoechondroplasia is also much like echondroplasia, but the typical features do not present at birth, usually transmitted as dominant trait. And this rhizomelic shortening or the proximal segment shortening uh, is seen along with angular deformities like gain virum and gain valgum. The predominant, the most uh, striking feature is the skull and faces are not affected. Uh, there is delayed dosification of emphasis. They are fragmented and irregular. Flattened femoral head and dysplastic acid volume is also can be noted. The COMP gene is mutated and uh, that leads to decreased facial uh, growth in this type of patients. So in summary, uh, these are rare diseases if we take individually, but collectively as a group, no, they are not that rare. So the genetic studies are important to get rid of the diagnosis odyssey that the, these uh, uh, children stuck in and whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing are most economic when you, they are used as first line test early on in the diagnostic journey and reanalysis of the sequencing data later on improves uh, the diagnostic yield significantly and finally the pre-test and post-test genetic counseling improves patients overall management so that is very very important so we'll discuss this case scenario at the end of this uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, the, here are the references. Over to you, Dr. Nimala. Uh, 